I am here just to sort of get a feel of what it's like, check out some of our hotels, meet the team on the ground, and just make sure that everything is running smoothly so that when you do come here, you're going to have the best time ever. Um, any questions that you might have along the way, feel free to pop those into the comments section. Um, I will be covering off quite a lot today, so if I feel like there is anything that I will get to, I will probably not respond straight away, but then we can um, open it up at the end as well. Hello, everybody. So in terms of how this sort of came about in terms of me being able to get to Sri Lanka and depart from Australia, there are a couple of steps involved that are new compared to what it was like travelling in the past. And it may seem like there is a little bit involved and it's difficult. It's really not that hard. Um, so a couple of things that I did have to do was a <clears throat> PCR test prior to departure, so 72 hours prior. So in Victoria, in Melbourne, I did have to book that online through Melbourne Pathology and actually go to a clinic that only does testing for travellers that are going overseas. Um, and there are a few other people that they test for, so like pregnant women and things like that. It's just to ensure that we can get the results back in time for our flights. Um, so I did get my results within about 10 hours. So it's a really, really fast turnaround. Um, also have to be double vaccinated. So you do need to carry a copy of your international vaccine certificate, which you can obtain through MyGov um, in your health record. So just something to bear in mind that you do need to be double vaccinated and keep a copy of that with you when you're traveling. Um, another thing that I had to organize was my Australian border permit and my Victorian border permit. Now, the border permits for states may vary. You may not need one depending on which state you are coming from. For Victoria, I did need to do one. It's really quick. It didn't take that long at all. Um, and in terms of the Australian one, you need to do it at least 72 hours before your departure flight back into Australia. Um, and you can only do it within seven days of that flight. So because I was only here, I'm only here for five nights, I was actually able to do it the day before I left. Um, but for some of you travelling, it may need to be done while you're overseas. But again, it's pretty straightforward. There's an app that you can download um, to keep on your phone, and then you just fill out your flight details and things like that, and then it's approved straight away. So they were all the things that I had to do that are different compared to travelling usually. So I still had to do my visa and all that sort of jazz, but they were just the new extra steps. None of it was intense, it wasn't hard to do, everything came back really, really quickly. Um, yeah, it was pretty straightforward, and I know it seems like a lot because there are more steps involved, but it's really not that difficult. Um, and all worth it to be able to travel and get out of the country for the first time in so long. <clears throat> um, so, in terms of getting to the airport, so I got to the airport two hours before because I figured it wasn't going to be that busy. Um, one thing I will mention as well, in Victoria at Melbourne Airport, you can also do your PCR test there. So they do have the option um, to do a test at the day of your flight and they return results within 90 minutes. So you do have to be there four to five hours before. Um, again, that's an option, otherwise do your normal PCR 72 hours. Um, but in terms of the airport, it was very, very quiet. So walking in, I did anticipate getting some currency sorted when I was there and just popping into the chemist to get a few last bits and bobs, but it was all closed. So just make sure that you are organising those things beforehand if you think there is something that you're going to need. I'm not sure how long that's going to be the case, but at the moment, um, a lot of the stores are closed. And the check-in process was pretty straightforward. So. I did do an online check-in. You still have to go to the counter because they do need to verify all of your paperwork. Um, it didn't take that long. Like the queue to do the normal check-in process, same as always, but once you get through that point, going through security, there was only one other person there when I went through. So I literally just two minutes, breezed on through, scanned my bag, they checked my passport, and then that was it. Um, and then I went to wait at my gate. So it was all very, very straightforward. Um, in terms of the flight, so I flew with Singapore Airlines. 
um, a few minor changes to the flight. So they have removed magazines and things like that um, at the back of seats just for safety and COVID protocols. Um, and they also do give you a um, like a little packet that has a sanitary item, so like a face mask and sanitizer, um, that also has QR codes on the back of it. So your in-flight menu, you scan with the QR code. Um, it's just that way to minimise people touching things on the flight, um, which was, again, easy, straightforward, but otherwise you do have to also wear your mask for the entirety of the flight. One hot tip is I find personally the surgical mask the most comfortable for longer periods of time. So if you are travelling, I definitely recommend taking quite a few of those with you. Um, but otherwise, yeah, flight, pretty standard, pretty normal. I found the food actually really good on Singapore Airlines and I'm normally a pretty fussy eater. Um, but no, it was, it was great. Um, transiting as well, it was pretty straightforward. There was nothing that I really had to do in Singapore. It was just go to my next gate, board, pretty standard. And then once I arrived into Colombo, there wasn't, again, all that much to do. All I had to do was I did the passport check and then just before you get to like the exit, they do check your um, health declaration. That is actually one thing as well that I forgot to mention, that there, for Sri Lanka specifically, there is a health declaration that you need to do. So it can be done online or you can organise it at the airport. I did it online just to make sure it was all done. It did ask me to upload a few documents like my vaccination certificate, uh, my uh, PCR test result. And because I've had COVID before, I also had to upload a copy of my uh, results of when I had COVID just so they had that all on record and on file. But again, they just scanned the QR code that was on the paperwork and then I was straight through. Um, then I was met by one of our representatives at the airport who walked me out to the pickup spot where I met my um, guide and driver, Deva, who has been absolutely amazing. Um, so it was quite late when I landed. I think it was about 11 p.m. Uh, drove to the hotel, the Goldie Sands in Ngambo. Um, so checked in quite late, basically got to the hotel shuffled my bags around a little bit and then went to sleep because I had a pretty early start the next morning. Um, I think I got up at about 5am anyway because of jet lag and then I was off to the fish market, the Lelaba fish market in Nagumbo, which is the second largest fish market in Sri Lanka. So I went there before sunrise just to really get a feel of what they were like. Um, it was a good opportunity for me as well just to get some really good footage and shots of the locals. Um, so it was a, it was a nice experience um, to go and do and watch the sunrise over the beach as well, which was pretty amazing. Um, from there, um, hi Diane, yes, it was lovely to meet you as well. I hope you're still enjoying the, the rest of your tour. <laughs> um, from there, it was a, about a four-hour drive on the way to Gambula for me to go to the Sigaria Jungles Hotel. So on the way there, um, I did a few stops, just some scenic stops to get some photos and things like that, which was really nice, um, and also to break up that journey. Once I got there, um, I did meet up with Diane, um, and we did a cooking demonstration, which was fantastic. So the chef set up by the pool and they showed us how to make a few um, different curries and a few different side dishes and they made it look way too easy. We were watching and thinking, oh, they've whipped these up in two seconds flat. Um, obviously they've been doing it for a long time but everything was uh, delicious, loved it. Um, one of the best meals I think I've had here as well which was fantastic and it's always nice having a a meal by the pool in the sunshine, with lovely company, of course. Um, so from that, I then sort of chilled out a bit by the pool, and then it was straight on to the elephant safari at um, Minaria National Park. So that was great in the Jeep. Um, spent uh, maybe just over an hour driving around, spotted quite a few elephants, which, was, which I love, absolutely love elephants. Um, and it's always a fun time when you can 
stand up and, you know, pop your head out the roof of the Jeep and get a really good look of everything. Um, so that was that. So it was a pretty big day. And then coming back to the hotel, I was exhausted. Um, and then we had Arak cocktails set up by the pool as well in the evening, which was very delicious. It's apparently very alcoholic. I think 35 and I didn't see them make, the, make them, but the shots were apparently quite big. Um, but it just tasted like a really delicious passion fruit cocktail, and they went down a little bit too easy. So absolutely love those. And then I had a bit of dinner and had a really early night. Um, and then the next day was off to Candy. So first thing in the morning before I left for Candy, I actually got up. I think I did about a 6 a.m. wake up to go to Figueria Rock. I wanted to get there nice and early just before it got too hot because it is about 31 degrees here every day. Um, and this time of year, the humidity does fluctuate quite a lot. Um, and I wanted to go when there wasn't going to be too many people. So got there nice and early and I have done it before. And I did look at it on the way there and think, oh, it looks high. Like, did it look that high the last time I was here? It does look overwhelming, but it, it's not. It is, um, it can be, it's just very hot. Um, it's not difficult, it doesn't take long. So I think you can basically get to the top within like 20 minutes, um, if that. It's just very vertical. So take your time, enjoy the views. The views are absolutely stunning from the top. It is amazing. Um, being able to see all of the surrounds and the mountains and how tropical and green and lush Sri Lanka is, is absolutely incredible. And you get to meet the dog, the dog that is always at the top um, of the rock that is again almost like a little bit of a tourist attraction. So they look after him and make sure he's all good. Um, so it's always a fun time. So I saw him last time I was here and again, I assume it's the same dog. And then on the way back down, there was quite a lot of monkeys, which was really cute. So I got some good shots of them. Um, they were very, very cheeky. There was a little baby. And it was so funny because the, the mum monkey like ushered them all together to almost take like this family portrait photo. Like they knew that people wanted them to get together and pose for a photo, which was really fun. And then, yeah, basically walked all the way down. Very easy. Um, much easier than going up. <laughs> and I then went back to the hotel, had some breakfast, chilled out by the pool again uh, before leaving for Candy. So it was only about a two-ish hour drive to Candy. Got to my hotel um, at the Earl's Regency, which was absolutely stunning. Quite a big resort. Uh, the pool was amazing. Chilled out for a little bit before going to the Temple of the Sacred Truth Relic. So we went there just before sunset. So we could, um, again, get some good shots and, you know, watch the sunset go down before they do the ceremony, which started at about 6.30. So I went through the temple and then they started the ceremony, which was, which was really nice. So they have, um, the monks come through and they have um, performers and then they open a casket at the end which I tried my hardest to get a photo of. I was there front and centre but as soon as that thing opens everybody rushes through and like it was almost impossible to try and to try and capture on my camera. Um, but it was a really nice authentic experience to be able to, to do uh, which again I've done it before, loved it the last time, loved it this time again. It's definitely one of those things that you want to do and be able to do it during the ceremony time because I think that's what makes it that extra extra bit special. Um, so from there the next day it was candy to Nuwara Alia. So stopped over at the Peridinia Botanical Garden. So I spent about an hour there in the morning just walking around, looking at all the wildlife. It was actually quite stunning. Um, I do I did love a good botanical garden, so it was nice just to sort of spend my morning walking through. It's very serene. It's just, again, a really great experience. 
Um, and then it was time for one of my favourite things, um, which was the scenic train. So that was from Peridinia to Nuwara Alia. So probably one of the things that you see a lot of when people go to Sri Lanka is the blue train that goes through the tea plantations. Although I was on one of the newer trains, which is like a blue and red kind of number. I do, I do prefer the look of the older trains, um, but it was still a fantastic journey. It does take about three hours. Um, it does move quite slow, um, but once you do go through those tea plantations, the views are absolutely stunning. Um, I loved it. You get to, if you're, when you're in first class, there is a viewing deck that you can go to where the doors are open. So it's a really good spot for you to be able to get some photos, um, film some footage, and just even like sit there. I did for quite a while when, you know, people were sort of done and dusted with wanting to get their photos. It's just nice sitting there and watching the view and having the breeze come through and it's, it's absolutely magical. So if you are someone that loves train journeys, this is definitely one that needs to be on your bucket list that you need to do for sure. Um, so then I arrived into Nuwara Alia at about, I want to say about three-ish o'clock in the afternoon. So I checked into the Grand Hotel, which was, my goodness, it was a destination in itself. Um, I got there and they did a site inspection for me, which I'm really glad that they did. They do do it for guests staying there if they want to, so I would recommend doing it. It just makes you appreciate what they're doing there even more. So everything from the number of different restaurants they've got, they've turned, um, it's not open yet, but they are converting a greenhouse full of plants and things like that into a vegetarian and vegan restaurant. And I think it is very exclusive. It only seats four people, which I think is great. Um, they also have a special Japanese teppanyaki in the kitchen with the chef that, again, I think speaks about eight people that you can book. Um, they have an Indian restaurant, a Thai restaurant, their regular restaurant with mixed foods. They've got a bakery on site, a cafe. There's just a lot going on. Um, and the gardens are absolutely stunning there. They uh, also have a farm. So I did a farm tour the next morning where they cultivate a lot of their vegetables. Um, and one of the things that I loved about that was they have a program where parents can go with their children. They can go and pick vegetables with the chef and then go back to the hotel with the chef and make a dish out of those things. And they also let the kids name any of the new baby animals, so the baby cows or pigs or whatever it might be. So they said that there was a lot of, a lot of animals named after children, which I thought was quite cute. Um, so I, yeah, I did the site inspection and then I sat down for a high tea, which I did not need. Let's be honest. I have been eating my body weight since I got here and I did tell myself, you know what? I'll just sample everything. I don't need to eat the entire thing. Have a bit of self-control out the window. They put it down in front of me. I absolutely inhaled the entire thing because it was delicious. Um, did I have any regrets? Absolutely not. Would I do it again? Of course I would. Um, so I had that, put myself into a bit of a food coma, and then just chilled out into my room for a little bit, went and tried some dinner at the Thai restaurant, which they recommended. They said it was very famous for them. So I went and had a nice Marsman beef curry, which was great. And then it was a very, very early night for me because, as you can imagine, I've been doing quite a lot every day and again the tours that we have aren't this intense or this jam-packed I'm just on a very condensed version to sort of hit the ground running and get a feel of what it's like then the next day which was yesterday there was the drive from Nuwara Alia to Colombo to the Move and Pick Hotel which is where I am right now on the amazing rooftop by the infinity pool it is a long drive day. Um, it was about five hours, uh, which it was actually quicker than normal. So they have opened a new freeway, which is only 12 days old, I was told. So instead of going sort of across from Nuwara Elia to Colombo, instead we went back up to Candy and then down, um, which did shave off about an hour from the driving time, which was really good. Um, on the way though, 
from Nuwara Aliyar did stop at the tea factory um, and had a really good site tour there. I did find it actually quite interesting. I'm not much of a tea drinker. On the occasion, I will have it. But the process that goes into them cultivating tea, I thought was crazy. So they have about 600 women that are the tea pickers and I think the minimum that they needed to pick each day was about 18 kilos. And all they're picking are the tiny buds. They don't use the big leaves because they don't produce the flavor. So you can imagine those tiny buds that weigh virtually nothing, 18 kilos, would be heaps. Um, and they are replanting about 10,000 um, seeds every day. So it is quite a huge number. And for every five kilos that they pick, they only get about one kilo of tea from that. So it's a huge process. There's a lot involved, which I did find, yeah, very interesting. Um, great for tea lovers. The tea was amazing. I just had an English breakfast at the end. Awesome if you want to bring some stuff home with you. Um, yeah, very, very delicious. So yeah, then it was just like the long, long, long driving day. Um, so I got to the move and pick at about 3 p.m., checked straight into my room came up to the rooftop for a couple of hours. The sunset from this view was absolutely insane. I've got lots of photos and lots of videos which I will be putting together um, once I'm back home so I can share with everybody um, so you can see everything that I've done while I've been here. Um, and then that sort of brings me to today, doing, doing the live. So this is my last day here. Oh, I did forget to mention one crucial thing. When I was in Nuwara Alia at the Grand Hotel, the morning that I left, so yesterday morning, uh, my guide had actually arranged for a doctor to come to my hotel to do my PCR test for me to be able to fly home. So there are two options now. You can do your PCR 72 hours prior to departure, or you can do a rapid test 24 hours prior to departure um, that has to be accompanied by a medical certificate. I opted for the PCR only because I have a lot on and I just kind of wanted to get it done and not have to worry about it the day that I'm traveling. So the doctor came to my hotel room, did the test, provided my email address, so I'll get the results by email today. Um, so it was really straightforward and really simple. It may not be the case like that when you are potentially on tour. It could vary. So it is one of those things that you just need to speak to your guide at the start of the tour. They'll arrange it for you. Typically as well, you will spend a bit more time at the end of tour in Colombo or Chilor and have a few days there. For me, because I was moving around every single day, it was easier to get someone to come to the hotel and organize it. Um, again, speak to your guide. They'll, they are so accommodating. Deva was absolutely amazing. I couldn't have asked for anything more. He just went above and beyond every time to make sure that I had everything that I needed so that I didn't have to worry or have any concerns whatsoever. So that's basically the trip, what I did. It's, again, it's my second time here. I absolutely adore Sri Lanka. It is, to this day, still my favourite destination, only because it has something for everybody. You've got the amazing beaches for the people that just sort of want to chill out and have that pop and drop holiday, relaxing by the pool. You've got safaris, you've got hiking, you've got cityscapes. It just covers off quite a lot of ground. You've got the scenic train. There's just something for everybody here, which I love. And it's so tropical, it's so sunny. It's a very, very underrated destination in my opinion. So if you haven't been or haven't even thought about going, start thinking about going. Now, probably some of the burning questions, and let me just see in the comment section anything that I need to address. Okay, let me find a bit happening here. Hello, hello, hello. Alrighty. Alrighty. Paul, taking rupees before I leave for Australia, if so, how much? Or wait until you get to the airport and exchange in Sri Lanka. So for both times that I've been to Sri Lanka, I did actually organise it once I got to the airport um, from the ATM. So being such a short trip, I 
I think I only took out about 200 Australian dollars and most of that was actually absorbed by my PCR test with the doctor. So that was about seven, seven and a half thousand rupees for the test itself and then seven thousand for the transport cost for the doctor to come, which I think is the equivalent of somewhere around the 80 to 90 Australian dollar mark. Don't quote me on it, but I think that was sort of about where it was. Um, Alrighty, one from Jen. How was it wearing masks in the humidity? So with masks in Sri Lanka, they are compulsory. So you do need to wear them everywhere, indoors, outdoors. The only time that you don't wear them is, example, where what I'm doing now, I'm on the rooftop by the bar. So if you're eating and drinking, you can remove the mask. Otherwise, you do need to wear them. Wearing the surgical masks, I thought, was probably the best option. So I do, at home, have those cotton ones. I just found that the surgical ones were better. Um, I honestly forgot a lot of times that I was wearing it. I had no issues. I wasn't struggling to breathe or anything like that. The only time that everybody collectively wasn't wearing them was climbing up Figueroa Rock. Just because, you know, you can get quite out of breath doing that. Otherwise, if you, everywhere you look, people are wearing masks. So they're really diligent here, which I think is really good. They're very conscious of COVID. Um, all of the hotels as well have measures in place. So there's no more in-room dining menus. Everything is QR coded. Um, they've removed as much as they can to prevent any sort of spread. Um, sanitizer everywhere. So my guide had um, sanitizer in the car. He also had extra face masks so I could change them constantly. Um, but in terms of the COVID presence here, it is business as usual. So the only difference that I found was between this time and when I was here four years ago was that everybody was wearing masks. That's the only difference. So nothing was interrupted, no touring was changed or sightseeing was changed because of COVID. Everything is honestly business as normal. So if you are concerned about that, no need. Don't have to worry about anything because it's, it's amazing. It's just like what it was four years ago and I absolutely love it even more the second time that I've been here, being able to experience it again. Now, I'll just make sure that there's nothing else in here. Okay, I think that's all the questions in the comments section. Uh, what about the photo op, mask or not allowed? Um, it is, I guess, you should be wearing a mask at all times. Obviously, there may be some instances if it's going to, like similarly in Australia, you do need to use your discretion and your judgment. I would always recommend keeping it on because it is a requirement here. Um, for myself personally, because I was very much the man behind the camera this time around and not in front of it, I didn't really have that many photo ops of myself, so I was constantly wearing my mask. Again, it was only in those instances like being here up the rooftop, eating and dining, but otherwise for the most part, there were definitely sure doing photo ops, taking masks off and things like that. Um, so you just want to be diligent, use your discretion, um, because there are laws in place here and there, from what I understand, there are fines for not wearing masks. So you do want to make sure, especially travelling overseas, that you are abiding by their rules and regulations and making sure that you are um, keeping yourself safe and others around you. Alrighty, I think that might be it from me today. Thank you everybody for joining in today. I hope this has been an informative session for you and you've gotten a glimpse of what it is like traveling in 2022 